Hey everyone. Welcome back. Hello. To good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Kayla. I'm a program manager on Windows, and today we're joined with Scott again, the wonderful Scott Hanselman, and also Demetrius, who works on the Windows Package Manager. Hello, hello. Hello. Howdy. <laughs> All right, so I think we could just jump right in. So Windows Package Manager, or WinGet, came out at Build in 2020. Is that? I think we announced it. Scott and I announced it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so what What has that progress been like um, since announcing at Build? And what are some things that have happened in the WinGet experience since then? Oh, great. Uh, so the, you know, sort of the first big thing is that uh, Build 2021, we actually released 1.0 and it was pretty phenomenal. Um, we were able to go, you know, kind of in market all the way down to Windows 10 version RS5, um, which was, I think it was actually technically kind of past end of life, but we were still able to kind of squeeze in there. Um, and that first release was a lot of the kind of basic functionality that you would want, install, upgrade, uninstall, you know, kind of the basics for a package manager. Um, you know, about uh, 90 days after that, we did the um, kind of the big release to get things out um, into the actual OS and get it distributed everywhere. Um, we're, a, we're a default app. Um, we're part of the app installer. Um, but one of the things that might happen is if you install Windows, it's not there by default quite yet. You still have to get an update from the store. You know, that might take 15 or 20 minutes. So depending on what you're doing when you're setting your machine up, it might already be there. You might have gotten into the OS and tried to use it before it had been updated. Um, next big milestone was our 1.1 release. And that was where we started support for the Microsoft Store. That was probably one of our biggest early on feature asks. And it was quite a challenge kind of working with the existing um, infrastructure and figuring out a way to leverage our manifest structure that is, you know, plainly visible to anybody that goes in and kind of wants to poke around at it. The store stood up a REST source for us and, and that allows us to talk to that API just like we would kind of a, a private REST source, which was one of the next things that we released. And then right now we're in the process, we're getting ready to flight 1.2 to Windows Insiders. There's a lot of work in there around supporting different architectures. If so, if you've got like a, an ARM based machine, You'll be able to install ARM packages. Um, if we can detect that you've got emulation available, then we'll even be able to figure out what will run under emulation, and we can install packages in that way for you. Um, and then, you know, from there is kind of going to the roadmap. But that's kind of what we've done so far. So, if how many people like have this? If I walk up to a random Windows machine, if it has Windows 11, it's got WinGet. But if I go to my non-technical parents' house during Thanksgiving, and I'm like, I'm going to install a bunch of great stuff when get, can I assure that they have it, or do I need to do something specific? So there's a very high likelihood they have it. And if they don't, you just need to install the app installer from the Microsoft Store, and you can actually search for WinGet, and it will show up as the app installer. OK, that's cool. I'm going to check that out. I trust you, but I'm also going to check that out right away. Just go into the store. Oh, I type WinGet. It actually suggests App Installer. It pops up immediately as I start typing it. So it's free, and you can hit Update or Get, and that's it. Yep. And if you're kind of on the on the other extreme where you're not just a you know normal Windows user and you're more of a more of a techie, then you can just go to GitHub, and we have all of the releases there, including all of the previews. Um, you can also, using information at GitHub, you can sign up to be one of our insiders. So, you know, we do release development builds on Windows insiders, uh, but you can still get a development build on stable Windows by joining our insider program. Okay, cool. How do I know what version I have? You can just type WinGet and then space dash V. It'll, it'll just spit out the version of WinGet you have. Um, but if you do WinGet and then you do space dash dash info, you'll actually get quite a bit more detail. We'll tell you what version of Windows you're on, which version of the app installer you've got. We'll tell you where your um, log files are located. So if you're trying to troubleshoot something, you can see where the logs are. And we'll include um, some additional information. If you're on an enterprise managed machine and they've got some group policy configured, 
you'll also be able to see any policies that are configured, um, which is also an aid in troubleshooting and kind of understanding why the package manager might be behaving the way it is. More importantly, when I install stuff, this, I get a uh, progress bar. Mm -hmm. How do I get a rainbow colored progress bar? So <laughs> that's in settings. The rainbow progress bar is one of our favorite features. Um, so if you type Winget settings, we're going to just pop up the uh, settings.json file and whatever your you know configured editor is. I happen to use VS Code. Looks like you do too. And from there, you're just going to go in and, and edit that schema. We've got the, uh, the JSON file there. So if you go to visual, you can go in and you can set your progress bar to rainbow. Ah, OK, here we go. Now we're cooking. Oh, retro. That's new. OK, cool. So I hit save. Oops, it's going to be, did I get it? Where's my thing? Where's my, oh, what? Look, there you go. It's happening. Give me some. Oh, yes. All right. <laughs> All right. I find this to be an acceptable product now. So <laughs> <laughs> that's we do what we can make other, you happy, Scott. What are the other things? I see a bunch of stuff in here in the JSON file. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if we've got any experimental features that we're testing, you can turn those on. Um, but that only works on developer builds. We don't put experimental features into the stable releases. Um, we have quite a few other things that uh, are configurable in the command line through different arguments you might pass in. Um, mm -hmm. Any of those as a candidate. Um, we've got um, people that are having some network challenges. Maybe delivery optimization is disabled, so they can switch to kind of the, the legacy WinINet installer. Um, if you prefer applications to be installed in user scope versus machine, you can have that as a setting. And we, and we have kind of a concept of both preferences and requirements. So if you say something as a preference, we will try to meet your preference. Um, but if we can't, then we will fall back to whatever is, is configured in the manifest by default. Um, and that, you know, and that same thing is going to hold true for architecture. Um, you know, there's just a, a bunch of things that are kind of configured that way. And a lot of the work that we're actively pursuing right now adds even more of those kinds of capabilities. Um, you know, one of the one of the things with the package manager is we need to have some reasonable default behaviors, but you know developers have very specific requirements on how they want their package manager to behave. So we will do pretty much everything we can to let them customize and configure the behavior so that so that it acts the way they want it to act and it behaves they want it to behave. Uh, before the show, we were chatting about some features, and you mentioned tab completion. Can you talk a bit more about how we could set that up? You bet. So um, on our on our uh, GitHub repository, uh, if you go into the um, doc folder, there's a completion file. And we'll basically go through and show you how to register that completion. And it basically gives you the ability to do tab autocomplete. Um, you know, I find when I set it up, it's a little bit slow um, kind of that first time through. We've got quite a few packages in the repository. I think there's a little more than 3,000 in the public repository. Um, but you can go through and you can get that tab auto completion. Yeah, in um, in PowerShell, oops, I know I forgot. I need to, we have a thing at work where we have to log in as our work. In PowerShell, um, you can register those completions and we have them with, um, uh, with .NET. So let me just log into here real quick. And uh, completion, probably should link to that from the, um, um, from the, uh, the readme. So yeah, this is interesting. So there's this complete command, right? So you go win get, this is what's happening behind the scenes, right? So if I type something like this, right? It's, yeah, you pass in like, the word, this is all happening secretly, but I'm just showing the behind the scenes. So it's like my cursor is at zero or something like that, right? I think it's like this. And I wanted to type something else. And that will then give it enough information to, um, to, to com do the completion. So for example, if I go dot .net, dot .net, I, and I hit tab, you know, it's going to auto complete something like that. 
I can register those. I've registered a ton of these, by the way. See, I've got, which one's mm. this? This is what's happening behind the scene. Here it is. I already have Winget, see? So PowerShell sees that I'm typing Winget and it passes in the word to complete, the cursor position, here you go, command line position, Winget complete right there. All that happens like behind the scenes. So I go Winget and I hit tab, see? So good. Nice. I'll do it again. Looks like win get I tab space and then you know type something and then hit tab and then goes and now I'm actually tabbing through .NET choices. What's really happening is it's calling win get complete or .NET complete or get complete or whatever, which mm -hmm. then returns back to PowerShell a array. And that array is what you're seeing here. I'm hitting shift tab and and tab. It's really cool. Yeah, I, I find it most useful when I'm kind of looking for different arguments I can pass in. Mm -hmm. um, when we, you know, when we just see the win get command run by itself, we display kind of the default help. But there are quite a few more options there. When we're troubleshooting, we've got verbose logs, um, you know, which isn't something that's kind of widely documented. But all of those things are there, and it allows you to go in and configure. And I don't know if you saw it, Scott. And, you know, Rainbow was in there, so you can even have your Ooh. your progress bar customized per command. Okay, I've never seen retro. All right, cool. So we have some questions in the chat about malware and how to make sure that the packages that are inside Package Manager are verified and legit. How do you go through validating uh, packages that are contributed to the GitHub? So the, the Winget Packages repository is where all of the manifests get submitted for the Windows Package Manager Community App Repository. When we get a PR, we're going to automatically go in and do kind of a, a dynamic check on, or sorry, a static check on the manifest schema to see if it's valid. We're going to look at any of the URLs that we have. We're going to run those through Smart Screen, see if they're already you know, known to be um, risky or, or if they're known to be good. Then we'll go in and we will download the installers that have been submitted. We will do malware checks on those. Then we actually stand up a VM environment and we install the program and we run um, you know, Defender and some other malware tools during the install to see what files are laid down, checking for anything. And then we'll even run the program and see if anything shows up at that point. So we do defense in depth. There's lots of layers of scanning that are happening. And we keep the SHA-256 hash for the installer um, and for the signatures for MSIX-based packages in the manifest. So if anything changes underneath us, you know, whether it was intentional or unintentional, if the file's been compromised, we will not install that file. Once we've gotten it down, we'll inform the user that there's been a hash mismatch. And that gives them mm -hmm. kind of ability to go look and see, you know, did something change? They can help us point to the new location if it moved. Um, or if it's something, you know, you go to some website and, you know, and their URL is, you know, get whatever the program is, um, if they're using kind of a, a vanity URL like that, it's fairly common that a new version comes out. Um, we do daily scans to see if anything's changed. And if it has, we attempt to, you know, automatically update it and fix it. Um, but certainly some users are a little bit faster than we are at getting in there and doing that. So, you know, all of the security scans are very much defense in depth. We partner with a lot of other AV vendors to, you know, compare their data as well, just so we know that these applications are safe and, and you know, it's worth installing them on a machine from a, from a risk standpoint. Um, sometimes when I search for things, I go like this. I say, when get uh, search for a thing and I make a guess. I make a mm -hmm. guess and I'll be like, you know, .NET or SysInternals or whatever. And mm -hmm. sometimes it seems like other people show up higher than the thing I want. And I wonder where is that thing coming from? So like, I understand that these are some apps that are in the store that have this word here. Um, and here's the thing I wanted. So it's not hard to find, but some of them don't even have the word .NET in it. I'm curious how one is more specific and what's a good way, like a good strategy for me to get what I want on the first try. So if you look um, a couple of columns over from where you are, where the match column is, you'll see we've got .NET there as a moniker. Um, 
you know, we treat moniker kind of like a, as a tag or a label or maybe a, you know, the most common name for a thing. Hmm. We do treat those with a bit of a unique constraint. So, um, you know, .NET being the most common thing, if you were to type win, get, show, and then just put .NET in there, we're going to go through and we're going to say, hey, do I have a package that has this exact name or an exact ID oh. or an exact moniker? We're going to try to kind of narrow that down to the best match we think we can find. Um, okay. Right now, what you're seeing is the store results get displayed before those from the community repository. We've mm -hmm. got some feature work coming to make that configurable. That's one of those things that a lot of developers really care about. Um, and enterprises may care as well. They may say, hey, we prefer to get a package from the store if that's available. Um, or, you know, we really do want the one from the community repository. Or if they stood up a private one, they can prioritize that as well. Yeah, that's and a tough one. Here is, sometimes I want stuff in the store first and sometimes I want stuff from Wingate first. So like there yeah. isn't an easy answer. And, uh, you know, and if that's the case, you can pass dash S and then the name of the source and we'll restrict the search down to that source. Um, and if you want to see what's configured, mm. you can just type Wingate source list and that'll tell you what sources are configured. Ooh, okay. Oh, I see. And then that, that's the order in which they're configured. Correct. So is it, I mean, could I theoretically clear clear the source and re, like like with NuGet, I can clear the sources and re-add them back in a different order and then flip the order if, if I cared that much. Yeah, if you cared that much, you could do that here as well. We do, right now we default to the order that the sources are listed. Um, and if you kind of get to a state where you think you may have messed up, you can do WinGet source reset and we will attempt to go back to whatever mm. the default settings were for how the package manager version was configured to begin with or how your enterprise group policy had it configured. I have never seen show before. What is the difference between show and search? Because I've always done search and I've always felt like it got a lot, like it's very wide net. I'm like, wow, there's a lot. But search show is quite might a, be what I want. Yeah, search is quite wide. Show is attempting to um, use some extra logic in terms of, you know, hey, if the user were to type install, what would we do? And, you know, so if you knew something mm -hmm. like Visual Studio Code and you knew the moniker was VS Code, if you narrow it down to exactly one package and you do when get show VS Code, we'll actually display some of the metadata that we have in the manifest. And, you know, that was really kind of the original intent for the show command. Oh. And we will narrow down which particular installer we would likely use on your machine with your configuration. So you can even get some more information there. Um, one of the other kind of lesser known features, if you're looking to see what versions we have, you can tack dash dash versions and we'll actually list out all of the versions for that package we have. Oh, okay. That's cool. This is really a good reminder here too. I want to point out that I'm hovering over this download URL and, and as a, you know, I think of myself as an advanced user, ultimately, I, I'm interested in what the executable is going to be that's coming down. And I like to look also at the URL. So if I'm going to install like, like Audacity, which is an open source audio um, application, I'm going to look at that URL. So folks were concerned about malware. I can tell that this is coming from a Microsoft CDN. So I know, and I know, and I recognize this executable. So I feel somewhat confident about that. Then I've got all of the other security features that you've added. From a, as a simplistic minded person, I'm just like, oh yeah, that's the EXE that I was gonna download anyway. Mm -hmm. And Wingate is orchestrating the download and the install of that and doing all those checks uh, in the back to keep me safe, which is cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I tend to think that, you know, most people that kind of grew up on Windows, they end up using their browser as their package manager. And, you know, that can be kind of a frustrating experience with the number of clicks you have to go through to kind of find the one that's gonna work on your machine and then go through the process of downloading it and installing it, um, you know, and you still may have a, you know, kind of a, a lack of comfort about whether or not what you're, what you're downloading is really what you wanted and whether or not it's safe. So, you know, the Windows Package Manager, you know, even though it's a CLI tool and a lot of people tend to be kind of daunted by that, we've really designed it to be easy and to ensure that you're not gonna get malware on your machine. Um, we've also got some ideas on how we can improve search. We've been discussing some of the concepts that the store has in terms of categories and subcategories. 
so that you might be able to further refine searches. Um, you know, but it's kind of a trade-off in the complexity and additional typing that you have to go through to to go down that. But certainly, you know, we are open source on GitHub. We'd love any community suggestions or feedback on things that we could improve or you know different approaches to solving some of these problems. So going back to the two sources of the store and Winget, does that mean that every app in the store is also available through Winget or is there some kind of like selection process or how does that work? So there are some things that may restrict what you're seeing. Um, you know, depending on what uh, country you're in, there may be applications that are restricted from certain countries. We don't do installation of paid apps right now. Um, and something else that, you know, is, is pretty annoying. Uh, it's possible to go into the Microsoft Store and for any of the content that's free and rated E for everybody, you're actually not required to, to be logged in with your Microsoft account. Um, but right now the package manager does have that as a requirement and we're working to remove that. So, you know, anything that you can download that's free and, and rated E for everybody is definitely available. We're also doing some work if you've got some paid apps. I know, um, you know, some people like some of the paid apps that are there. And if you've already paid for it, we'd like to be able to install those for you as well. Um, and then if you haven't paid for it, we'd like to be able to give you kind of a link directly into the store where you can acquire it. Okay. And anything that we're building into kind of our manifest schema, we're making sure that those things are available to everybody. So you notice when you install things from the store, you're getting that um, prompt on kind of the, the agreements that are involved. If you've got agreements for your software and you've been a verified publisher, you'll be able to go in and do that in the community repository. But for enterprises, they can automatically go in and add the appropriate agreements themselves. So, you know, we're not doing anything for ourselves that we're not exposing for anybody else that would be using the package manager, including standing up their own private sources. Will, will this, there are versions for, for app, like paint.net's one of my favorite apps, it's a paid app. So I wish I could install that one. So I can't do that now, even though I paid for it, but soon. But there's no version. Will that have a version there? We are expecting to start getting versions from the store in a future release. Um, one of the scenarios that we'd like to be able to go through is an upgrade scenario. And right now, what we do is, you know, if you do Winget list, we actually display everything installed on your system, regardless of where it came from. And then we attempt to match the programs that are installed on your system with something that we've got in one of our sources. So right now, if you look on the right hand side, you'll see when gets listed for a bunch of those. That's an indication that we believe we have a manifest for that package. And if there's a version next to it, it's likely that it's newer than what's installed on your machine. Oh, OK, look. So Belina Etcher is a tool I use to take my um, my ISO files that I download, my disk image files, and flash them onto an SD card for using a Raspberry Pi. So you're saying I have 172 installed, but there is a newer one available. Correct. Can I? How can I upgrade that in place without doing anything here from the command line? So you can just do Winget upgrade, and then you can either, in quotes, put the name if it's got spaces, or you can use the ID. So if you're installing something with the source of the store, will it automatically update through the store, or do you have to go through Winget to do it? So there's a, there's kind of two paths through the store right now. There's the traditional path where you've got an MSIX package. It's been vetted and certified by the store and kind of signed and those things install and those things will automatically upgrade. The newer experience that we recently released allows you to do sort of the legacy types of applications, the, the Win32 applications. Mm. Right now, the expectation is those, the store does not automatically keep them upgraded. Um, typically it's something where the publisher would build an upgrade flow into their own tool, but we're working with them to expose kind of a manual upgrade option for packages that don't upgrade themselves. So that's something that we're hoping to be able to see in the store in the future as well. That's cool. So I just upgraded right there. Didn't even know. So I could actually probably write a script to go through and up to, I installed Skype from Winget. There's a newer version. So I could go through and upgrade these with, with a script if I wanted to. Or you could just type Winget upgrade. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. it will display everything that it recognizes that has an upgrade. Ooh. <gasps> wow. 
And if you do winget upgrade dash dash all, it will attempt to upgrade every single one of them. I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have um, quite a few edge cases. Um, you know, we are dealing with a lot of um, legacy installers, you know, different EXEs, different MSIs, different MSIXs. Um, not all of them support a graceful upgrade when we use the silent parameter. And mm -hmm. one of the things we do, we kind of default to what we call silent with progress, where we're asking the installer to be running in a mode where it doesn't require any user interaction. Mm -hmm. um, you can still tell us to install with interactive and you'll get kind of that traditional experience. Um, so, you know, we definitely have some rough edges here, you know, especially looking at kind of the, you know, the, the number of applications that you've got. Odds are one or two of those is probably going to install side by side rather than mm -hmm. upgrading. Um, and we're doing some other work to kind of improve that experience and to not install things that are automatically going to upgrade themselves and, unless you ask us to. And we'll, you know, we'll run into a scenario that's also pretty common where you really don't want to upgrade. Like, you know, you've got Python 3 there. You know, if a yeah. Python 4 were to come out and you wanted to stay on Python 3, we need to give you the ability to kind of pin that to tell us don't upgrade this or yeah, don't upgrade um, it past version 3. Oleg in the in the chat is saying that they use Winget upgrade all. So they just kind of YOLO and just go for it. But I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, you know, I feel fine upgrading like these, like because they're minor versions. But then like, oh my posh, I had no idea that there I'm two versions behind. And that's such a fundamental part of my life. I don't want to take that chance. And then USB IPD is a thing I did with Craig. Uh, uh, from WSL, and that I didn't know that was a major version. So I'd like to do an upgrade, like dash dash minor versions or something like that. You know what I mean? That's a great feature. Ask I haven't seen that. I will go ahead and add that right. to the to the repository now. I want I want to do less threatening chain like anything here that's not scary. You know, like this major minor build, right? Mm -hmm. But I think your point's great. Like I'm not going to take Python three, you know, two to three, or doing something dramatic like that. But like GitHub CLI, I didn't know that was updated. That's probably important. .NET, these are all great, easy upgrades, except for the two. So the only thing keeping me from a dash dash all are two scary major versions. So that's a good idea. But Oleg in the chat is very happy to do that. Uh, one of the things that I was talking to Kayla about is that you're starting to see a community on top of WinGet. I'm noticing mm -hmm. websites that are not Microsoft websites that have these really kind of cool things they're building on top of what's going on here. And do you have any others that we should know about? Um, so those two are probably the most predominant ones I've seen. Um, since we are open source and the repositories are publicly available, it's pretty easy for developers to go in, pull that metadata down and build rich experiences around these things. Um, uh, Winstall.app has been around since early days of preview. Um, uh, the developer that's been doing that, you know, just did it as kind of a, a passion project. And since then, it's just really become pretty widely used. That's great. Looks like Mehdi is a, a, a computer science student, so we can buy them a, uh, a coffee for doing and that. I have definitely work. done that more than once. <laughs> That's super fun. So that's an interesting idea right there to just build on top of this. And then I understand that there's also GUI applications as well. That um, There are a couple. Um, we, we get asked about building a GUI, you know, quite often. I think, you know, our focus right now is really on kind of core features and functionality. Um, it's pretty easy for somebody to build a GUI. We're also going through a process of kind of refactoring some of the behavior into a comm service. And that makes it even easier for other applications to integrate with us and kind of, you know, build their own UI, their own experiences on top of it and still have all the benefit of all the package manager functionality underneath. This is really cool. It's actually generating scripts with the and here. So it's saying install this and install this and install this. Is there any thoughts for future WinGets where I would, um, pass it, a, pass it a, 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 a YAML file or a list or an any file as an input. Yep. So on the, on that Winstall app side, if you click on the WinGet import button on the right, um, we actually have a JSON schema 
that okay. allows you to go in and specify packages by source. You can also specify the version and we'll basically treat that file as you know, a set of instructions to go through and install everything that's listed. Um, we also have an export command. Um, you know, there's still some challenges with with matching there, where you know sometimes there's not enough metadata in what's getting reported in um, Windows Apps and Features. But we're continuing to improve this and and kind of enrich the manifest so that we've got an ability to do better matching and and capture capture more of these packages. I see. So in this case here, it's saying, of course, like I got the Witcher from uh, uh, from Steam, so that's not available. So it didn't it didn't it can't install the Witcher for me uh, when I did the export. So that's what those warnings were. Those are all my non WinGet things. Right. But I didn't even know that was a thing. So here, I just hit copy to clipboard, and I came over here, and like now I've got that pack. So I have like the browser pack or the uh, the dev pack or whatever. So you could even make one of these JSON files for your company. Like if you were kickstarting mm -hmm. a new company with a bunch of devs and you say, all right, everybody, welcome to the company. Win, get, install our developer stuff dot JSON or yep. win, get import rather. Yep. You could do that even on a, on a team level. We've been kind of working on that for our team where, you know, when you get started, you just run this, run this import and it gets most of the applications that we would normally use installed. That's super cool. Um, there's a question in the chat about semantic versioning. People feel strongly about their versioning. And I mentioned that minor thing and someone said that would be a major thing. Uh, what about thoughts around semantic versioning like NuGet? Because apps aren't quite like NuGet and they don't all follow those rules. Yeah, it's pretty challenging. We, you know, we see things where, you know, it looks like semantic versioning, but it doesn't behave that way or kind of honor the, the semantic rules with semantic versioning. We're going to attempt to take whatever kind of a version string you have and apply consistent behavior to make sure that we're getting kind of the latest one. It's it's not uncommon to see dates um, where you know they do year dot month dot day. Those are pretty easy to determine. Other times we'll see packages that might use what I would call as kind of a marketing version where you know they'll say, hey, version eleven is kind of a major release, and they'll put some marketing around it, and then under the hood it might actually just be kind of like the next logical minor version and not even be a major version um, sort of technically under the hood. So we've been working on extending the manifest schema so that you can still display your marketing version. And then we actually know kind of what the, you know, a, a more accurate version is underneath, but we're not going to enforce that you have to have semantic versioning to get into the repository. We're trying to meet developers where they are and not cause them more pain. Mm, that's a good point. And that point about the real version versus the marketing version, I think as, as someone who likes Windows 11 very nicely, but who knows, it's version 22,000 something, something. Everyone's got a, hey, it's Hanselman version 3, but it's version 36 underneath. That's a yeah. very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, that, that also impacts us quite a bit with matching. So when people are submitting manifests and we're looking at all that, you know, we're doing our best to kind of see what entries got recorded. Does that metadata match? Um, you know, and just trying to, to, you know, really not make people have to rewrite their software just so that they work in the package manager. Sweet. So I know we're running out of time, but I did want to ask um, if there's any future things we can look forward to uh, for Winget before we head out for today. You bet. So. Um, we're getting ready to start uh, ramping up on 1.3. I think the two biggest features there is going to be support for what we're calling portable applications. So this is just like a loose EXE, something like NuGet, where you just need this EXE on your system and in your path. But we're going to go ahead and record it in apps and features, treat it like a first class package, and give you the ability to do upgrade and uninstall with it. Um, and then you know, lots of those are packaged up in zip files, or you might have a zipped up installer. So we're going to add support for that as well. And then some other work we're doing with uh, Intune is going to start making it where Intune can actually leverage the Windows Package Manager sources so that enterprises can kind of use that to help keep current with the different versions of software they've got and leverage that to manage the software on their company's machines. Sweet. That sounds awesome.
Yep. And then uh, I would say the next big ones, you know, that we're kind of contemplating for 1.4 um, is that pinning functionality that I discussed. Um, mm -hmm. And then kind of the real big complicated monster is dependencies. You know, we want to be able to make oh. sure we can install something, get the dependencies right, get those installed on the machine first, figure out how we're going to handle when reboots are required, you know, or even turn on Windows features for you. You know, if you were to do Winget install Ubuntu, um, you know, we'd like to just be able to turn on Windows subsystem for Linux and and register Ubuntu for you and have it work. Yeah, that would be awesome. I would like that feature. <laughs> That'd be great. Awesome. Well, I think we're out of time. So thanks so much for coming on. Um, this has been a really awesome episode and we'd love to have you back uh, sometime in the future. Appreciate it. Just let me know. Cool. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks. See ya.